is what we call clean assembly. Um, and we don't grind metal or make wood chips here. Um, this is where stuff kind of comes together, um, medium-sized things. So electronics and media is there. That's like our conference room and accounting and HR up there. And we've got wood and metal fabrication there. And things kind of come together. Big things, we use the crane to lift them. And right now, we kind of cleared some stuff away. This is waiting to get shipped. It's a giant star made of um, colored glass and computer-controlled LEDs. It's called Crossroads of Dreams. It's for the Oklahoma Museum of Popular Culture, which is celebrating comic books, pulp fiction novels, um, concert posters, a lot of which came out of Oklahoma, which I didn't know. And so the Ben Day printing process, which is the colored dots, which is a little different than the CMYK, but it's that iconic process of creating these pulpy, low-resolution images that fill comic books. That's what the glass spheres are representing. And then there's all these animations that animate how cultural currents move through and separate it out. It's just pretty stuff to look at. <laughs> Don't mind all my... <laughs> you know, you have to have an explanation, but most people just buy art because it's pretty. Um, and that's okay. So that's where things like this come together. You know, the metal is cut on the water jet, laser, et cetera. The glass we have made in a glass factory. Other parts are made in different places in the shop and they, and they come together here. That's just shipping and receiving and where we store flat materials. And in 20 years, we will be making things purely additively, I'm sure. Um, in the past, we didn't work on these weird rectangular flat things. Um, we're just in this period of making where stuff comes in sheets and we bend it, cut it, twist it, wiggle it, or whatever. It's not how nature makes. It's probably not how humans will make. I did have someone five years ago during a tour said, oh my goodness, I can't believe you've invested so much uh, with the CNC router and water jet and all the material on the racks in something that's so outdated, we're all going to be 3D printing everything soon. And I said, do you even have a 3D printer that doesn't mess up the print halfway through? <laughs> and we have half a dozen 3D printers, and they're making little gadgets and stuff. And they're, they're helpful and indispensable. And some of our new pieces will be 3D printed in metal um, at outside factories, parts of them. But for now, we're in the world of cutting flat stuff. And that's just where we're at. <laughs> um, so we have the parts library so that if we get an idea, we can make it quickly. Like we'll stick an LED in a pufferfish skeleton. And you know, what if you had that idea and you didn't have the pufferfish? You know, <laughs> you send someone to the beach. And then we have all of our screws and nuts organized. When I'm home, um, I even labeled some of the drawers in my closet. And my wife was like, oh, good grief. I'm like, that's one less thing to think about. Where are the socks? You know, and here, like if you're going to have a lot of stuff, you need labels. You need to organize it. So, you know, I think art is always about a physical object that transmits meaning beyond the person who created it to another person. Or a physical action like dance or a play. Or a poem, the way it's arranged on the page. And if you think about art that you love, you may not know the artist, but some meaning comes through. And art is an attempt to get out of hell, the hell of personal solitary existence, the hell of knowing you're going to die. And that's why I like stainless steel. It's going to last 10,000 years. <laughs> um, this is woodworking and storage. We're not doing a whole lot of woodworking right now. So let's move on to... So this is like a stained glass. This is a little pavilion for... There's a police headquarters in Lawrence, Kansas. And... Um, Lawrence has a pretty good program of community policing, and they're making it better. Um, and it, their new police headquarters is adjacent to an intersection between a, like a hiking path and a running path. And I said, well, let's turn that into a tiny little park, and we'll make this little pavilion. And this is about seeing through the eyes of other people. And there's a missing part. There's a chandelier that hangs in the middle that at night projects patterns on the ground, including secret patterns. Um, but these are just faces. There's old, tired eyes. There's 
um, more young, happy eyes. And the theme is just looking through the eyes of another person, which I think is a way to encapsulate both sides of the debate about policing is, you know, that officer has to decide in a split second what to do with everyone watching them. But at the same time, you know, those citizens are innocent, you know. How do you resolve that debate other than to understand other people's lived experience? So I wasn't sure how this was going to turn out. I had rendered it. I still haven't totally decided if I like it. But I think I like it. I mean, you never know. Uh, you design it in the computer, but what's it going to be like in the space? And I will say it depends. So there's like green areas and there's a giant, you know, this part of Kansas has these big blue skies and it rolls off to flatland. So you'll be able to look through these at the blue sky. Here, you know, there's the mess of building in the background. I really think looking through these eyes at the sky and seeing the landscape inverted, each of these is a tiny lens, is going to be really cool. Anyway, we'll see. <laughs> a lot of it is the unknown. You don't know how a piece is going to turn out until you've done it. So you have to, you have, to have a little courage to eventually, but I think it's going to be good. So we had start, Creative Machines started a mile and a half away in a small building where everything was on top of itself. Um, not a lot, not unlike the garage where I started the company, where the table saw fed out over the washing machine and I had to decide whether to do laundry or make things. So we were looking for a little bit more space and one of our employees was driving by as this building went on the market and it was, it had been used for fiberglass fabrication. It was hanging tendrils of congealed resin with fibers on it. Every time you walked in here, you left itching. And there was conduit hanging off the walls. And when it rained, water flew through electrical boxes. And there were sparks, and the lights flickered. And um, I brought my son, who was 10 at the time here. And we're going through, and it's dark, and the lights are flickering. And it was all grungy. And he said, oh, it's the perfect place for a zombie apocalypse. Um, and then I said, well, I'm thinking that this could be the new home for Creative Machines. And he goes, dad, you're not thinking of buying this. Oh, better not tell mom, you'll get in so much trouble. <laughs> but, you know, for every problem, there's someone who knows how to solve it. So we hired our friend Potato. Um, Potato is a guy who gets things done. Who ha and so Potato and another person rented a huge gas-fired, high-pressure, heated pressure washer, put it on a lift, dressed themselves in Tyvek suits, and they just went through the whole facility and, like, washed everything from the inside out, and the rivers ran gray with fiberglass grunge. And then we painted everything. If you paint everything a light gray color, I don't know, paint covers a lot of sins. And so we, we spent the last five years kind of making it a functional facility. We have yet to add heat. Um, <laughs> mostly air conditioning is the issue. But this space is big enough for us to build most outdoor plaza pieces. You can see on the ground where we've anchored previous pieces and then we cut it off. Um, the crane lets us rehearse the installation. We have tie downs in the floor to stabilize things. And then a flatbed can pull up outside those doors, and the crane can actually run outside the building. And then sometimes, for a long, detailed loading, this faded yellow line on the floor is the footprint of a truck. We'll bring a truck in and load it here. So a lot of it is set up for building and shipping large pieces. The piece you see behind, with these are recycled car tires. Um, it's lying on its side. It's the wet wheel. This is for downtown Tucson along the downtown Lynx pathway. And the reason why this poster describing it is so old and grungy is that this is a commission that I won in 2009. And due to various delays, uh, downtown Lynx um, haven't gotten around to it until now. So it's a bicycle wheel that is astride the path. And then as you ride through, tiny jets of water become the spokes, and you are the hub. Um, and, that can, and, and of course, there's a temperature sensor and a time of day sensor, and there's a sign. So you don't have to get wet. 
but if you want to, you can. And then all the water is what irrigates through careful landscape design the little pocket park around it. So this came about because I used to ride my bike, and this is halfway between home and work, and I, was, and I would douse myself with water in the summer, and by the time I would arrive, by the time I was halfway through, I was dry and hot again. I was thinking, it would be so cool if there was like a splash park here. And then, you know, if you are a basically good person who's selfish, you are going to end up serving other people. I mean, that's the theme of, of Rousseau's Emile on the education of young people. And that's partly been the theme of my life. If you have something that you think you need, chances are somebody else could use it too. So I did a little research, and there's a lot of people who live in that area north of downtown, and there isn't really a splash park nearby. So you can walk through and you'll get squirted. Um, anyway, it's been really popular. The city um, safety manager loves it, which was a surprise. And uh, a lot of people, when we had it set up, were running through in their suits and having a great time. So I think this will be a wonderful addition to downtown links. Um, it's going to... Um, where Bicus used to be, and when Bicus moved to, I think they're up on North Stone, um, it's not really a specific address. If you drive by the construction area now, it's just sort of a, um, the pedestrian path is gonna go north of the road, and there's just like a little pocket where you can circle around here. It's where, like, um, uh, what was the bakery? It was like, not Lonely Planet, but, uh, well, it's a small planet bakery. It's like where the small planet uh, bakery used to be. Oh, it'll be part of the loop, essentially part of the loop, yeah. As the loop in now includes the, uh, the new downtown links extension. So yeah, you'll be able to ride through this. I think it's gonna be wonderful. So um, Arby here is building a giant computer controlled marimba. So, you know, a marimba is the tuned uh, like wooden blocks you play with hammers. This is going to be marimba blocks arranged in a circle. The resonating tubes go back and then wind around on the inside because uh, you need kind of long tubes for the deep tones. And then there's a giant table where people, by moving little glass balls around, make the sounds that play on the marimba. And then this is a climbing structure for a rooftop that Boston Properties is building, a rooftop, a public rooftop park in downtown Boston, um, adjoining where Google's Boston headquarters is. And so these are spread out, and when you, and you're accessing them from all sides, we developed a coating that does not build up heat in the sun, and that took a lot of research. We looked at military coatings, we looked at what the railroads coat the sides of train tracks with to avoid solar gain, and that'll get you maybe 10 degrees. But we developed this four-layer system that just does not gain heat in the sun. Like at noon in Tucson, you can just put your hand here and it doesn't get hot, which is a really interesting challenge. And so we did that. This gets fall surfacing under it. And of course, from one particular viewpoint, you see the word joy. Um, so I'm thinking about naming this Find Joy, because that's the instructions. <laughs> and then, you know, people will pose in the hearts. Um, these are going to rise out of uh, artificial turf. So I think this is kind of, kind of fun. There's nothing wrong with fun um, <laughs> in a world where, where we don't devote enough time to it. Um, and, you know, it takes a lot of analysis. We work with playground safety and adventure course experts on a lot of the things we do. This one is designed to be climbed on. Some things are not designed to be climbed on, but we know that they will. So we have them analyzed from that perspective as well. So the spacing here, you know, you're not going to be able to get your head caught. Um, the height that you fall has been analyzed and fall surfacing added. It's, we think things through a lot. When I was a kid, there were these ads for Golden Graham cereal. Oh, those Golden Grahams, crispy Golden Grahams, and a bunch of people would pull up in pickup trucks, they'd all jump out, and they'd build something in the middle of nowhere, and I was, I was on board with that, 
and then they'd have their Golden Graham cereal, and then they'd go away. And I was a young maker at the time, and I was like, oh, that's cool. Do people really do that? And only now do I realize, and when people say, hey, can I get involved in one of your builds? I have a day a week I could, I'm like, this stuff doesn't happen without a whole lot of planning. You have to build it in your mind first. You have to, you know, Michelangelo did like a year of sketches and walking the streets of Florence, sketching young women's faces before he sculpted the Pieta. And then he would draw it on the outside of the marble. The, the kind of boring stuff. It's not like he just said, well, time to get to work and picked up the chisels and started doing it. So it's like consulting with playground people. It's like, permitting, it's like engineering, wind loading, live loads, dead loads. Um, there's a lot of the kind of boring behind the scenes work we do. I will say that the architects who come to work for Creative Machines are thrilled. They say, oh my goodness, you go from a concept to something installed in nine months. I spent five years rearranging stadium seats to optimize restroom access and it was soul killing, you know. <laughs> Some bigger projects take longer to do, so we have the nice balance. We do plan, we're really careful, you know, we analyze risk, we use outside consultants where needed, but still stuff gets built. But yeah, it's more planning and designing and then building. The deep cultural diversity of Tucson, I think, was a big draw. So I grew up in the New York area and I lived in many cities. My wife grew up in Long Island, we met in Florida. Um, there's a lot to love about Tucson. Our son is multiracial and gay, and he's not hassled. Um, our, all of his friends are very diverse, and he's gonna get a big shock when he goes to work in some other city, let me tell you, because Tucson just is built on, on difference, not to say that there aren't issues. Um, but part of it is commercial real estate, a really large industrial base, because the Tucson industrial base serves the maquiladoras in Nogales, a lot of that comes out of Tucson. The ranches, um, the defense contractors, the U of A is all serviced out of Tucson. So there's an above average concentration of the resources that you need to build big things. Um, you know, I was also looking at Santa Barbara. I'd still be working out of a closet, you know. Uh, big space and just people making stuff in, in the desert. The desert is sort of the spiritual place where stuff gets built. Um, so we have a, a, um, a visitor, from uh, an exchange student from Indonesia who's Muslim, and she was deciding whether she should go on a camping trip. And I said, well, you know, all the Abrahamic religions began with a camping trip in the desert. If you count the Jews wandering for 20 years, if you, call, if you take Jesus' 40 years in the desert, and you take Muhammad, I said, there's something about the desert that brings you back to the basics and you have to build it up. There's not all these big trees towering overhead that you have to compete with. Um, so I like the desert, love the Tucson culture, industrial base. Um, it's home, you know. I'm not an Easterner who's just staying here. Tucson is definitely home. <laughs>